Jumping Jesus on a pogo stick, it's time for full disclosure. Full disclosure, news and commentary number 65, 65, 65, 65, 65. Hope you're doing well. This weekend is July 4th. Whoop, whoop. Um, July 4th is a big deal if you're a PCW person uh, because we used to, we used to get to do the uh, Revolutionary War show. <clears throat> and uh, boy, don't get to do it. Uh, not that I, I don't know if it was ever in the works, but it's a bummer, right? People having to cancel stuff. But we are also getting things going. A few shows to talk about. A few shows coming up to talk about. That's always exciting. But uh, let's just jump into it. Our commentary is about selectivity and how many people are showing it. Um, uh, I've gotten a lot of great feedback um, about a number of things that I've done lately, especially this speech about the state of pro wrestling, particularly in the indies. And the four R's that people are going to have to do to get things back on track. Thank you for that. Uh, my kid suggested that I put it, since full disclosure, news and commentary is um, one of the more popular things I do is to put the speech at the end. Or I may or may not do that. We shall see. But that's what our commentary is about. Our Patreon people that we love so much. Dan and Jeffrey and Brett and... Joe Black and Derek Diana, Southern Honor, Larry, not that one, but the other one, Rob Rod, Brian, uh, the Double Dropkick Show, and then the three big Big Mac daddies, Eric, the World Walker, Viral Pro Wrestling, and the OG Myron. Speaking of the OG Myron, uh, I really, really, really liked and highly recommend the last tapped out podcast i love the discussion that they had i told them both that this already um, but i really do recommend you watch it the gunner miller the chat with gunner with matt sells was also a ton of fun um very conversational in tone and just really light-hearted but in a good way i like i like that gunner's opening up more and um, he's getting to be someone who asks very good questions um, which is pivotal when you're doing that kind of thing. Speaking of asking questions, on the last tipping point, we had Jay Fury. Um, and it ended up it was just Jay Fury, but I think that worked out for the best. 45 minutes of talking to that man about all things wrestling and his career and uh, how the world is changing and how that's reflected in wrestling and that kind of thing. Um, normally, I wouldn't announce who our guest is for the next tipping point this early, but I'm very excited about it, so I'm going to go ahead and do it for the July 7th show, which is Tuesday night. Um, we are going to have Thunder Rosa, the NWA World Women's Champion, and one of the people who's founding Mission Pro Wrestling, which is going to have entirely female talent from the office on and the workers and the referees and everybody's going to be a woman and it's going to be in texas and very excited to talk to her about all of that Whew. let's get into this so twe at a chattanooga i believe had 75 people practicing social distancing and masks and uh grandpa who owns it's a uh, troubling racist dude <laughs> So, with the help of Matt Griffith and Scott Hensley, uh, the grandson, I guess, has taken over, at least in storyline. Is that for real? Uh, that's what people have been asking me. Uh, do you think that this is just a smokescreen to sort of cover um, the grandpa's antics? And I took a look at the grandpa's antics right before here um, with screenshots that people had taken for me so I could see it. And it was like, it's pretty iffy, pretty bad. I mean, there's a number of promoters who say dumb shit and uh, comment dumb shit on people's things um, who the boys seem really comfortable with, uh, like the management at NEW. <laughs> I was just read that shit and just go like, uh, but, you know, neither here nor there. People are certainly allowed to have their opinions and people are allowed to have 
what they think and not everybody needs to be canceled but i will say um as we say every week there are people who have not done themselves any favors in fact uh, something i would be curious about is a pro wrestling circuit ever going to run again um i i can't see hide nor hair of anything the the last two posts that they had were that they're canceling their march show but to look forward to an april show um, which obviously never happened and haven't heard about anything since and tommy pitts has been on his personal trip um for months and it's hard to imagine that pro wrestling circuit is going to open again which is bad in the sense that they really seem to have it going on with sponsors and all that kind of stuff and it seemed to be rolling along a lot more sizzle than steak but that's an easily correctable problem but now it just feels like the thing's never going to open. That It's that way for a few leagues, but Pro Wrestling Circuit is just the most notable. Um, but leagues that are going to run soon, of course, Southern Honor has their big announcement in two days about when they're going to open. Somebody astutely pointed out that this is going to coincide with Kemp probably lifting what restrictions are left. And that's why they sort of timed it with that. Cool. Um, the uh, WrestleMerica is going to run August 8th. Um, and then the cancels, right? Action having to cancel July 18th, uh, sucks. And I saw that they were on the lookout today for outdoor venues. So they're getting the bug and they're getting the itch to run again. I highly recommend the Exodus project by David Ali. Of course, I already put over the first three parts of it, but there's a fourth part. You want to watch that stuff if you're not watching it. It's really, really great. Pro South, uh, apparently this show was better than their first one. I still haven't looked at them. I said I would, but <sighs> frankly, I have people who pay me to like look at stuff and they're going to always take priority over the people that don't pay me. That sounds really harsh, but it's really true. And frankly, looking at another wrestling show is something that I like. I, I just don't get excited about. Um, you got to understand why. I mean, look at today. The reason I'm doing this full disclosure news and commentary um, relatively early is because I saw that there's the road to Fighter Fest. And anytime AEW does like a, a hype show, I'm going to watch it um, because I feel like there's a lot to learn there. And it's happening today at 7. And then Raw comes on at 8. So it's going to be a four hour block of me taking in wrestling shit. hard to get excited about raw um unless of course you are covid and then you're very excited about raw happening here's your chance to spread out yay wwe mm. what else is going on what else is going on um ah, some georgia people getting affected uh by the covid thing that sucks um Renegade Championship Wrestling is rolling on. They keep doing shows. And, yeah. Oh, and you want to check out Peach State Pandemonium as well. The, the band came back together. The old timers got together to talk about Mr. Wrestling number two. And I thought it was really, really well done. Cool. So, yeah, I'm looking at Road to Fighter Fest at Raw at AEW Dark Tomorrow Night. And then AEW Dynamite for... Night one of two of Fighter Fest. Big time. Big time. Oh, crap. It's time for Full Disclosure's Simp of the Week. Steven Platinum's Simp of the Week. So, who is the Simp of the Week? Mac tonight herself, Tessa Blanchard, you simp. Um, Tessa Blanchard is also going to factor into my commentary, which will be right after simp of the week. But it's you really you couldn't send in a promo. Really, you couldn't send in a promo. People can argue back and forth about all kinds of things. One thing they cannot argue is that Impact Wrestling, and uh, if you've been a longtime listener of mine, the thing that people say that surprises them about me most often is that I tend to be an advocate for the performers over promotions. And that's true. And 
with Tessa Blanchard's deal, I'm stunned at how people are just like moving on. Like, mm, well, wouldn't Tessa be great to have in WWE? And then she could take on Charlotte. That would be amazing. And her dad's in AEW. That would be cool. And where's Tessa going to go? And like all these news stories, like WWE contacted her right away. And everybody's like, yay. How about how Tessa fucked over Impact for a second? Her simp ass fucking made her world champion. Took tons of shit for it. All this stuff came out about her as she was about to win the world title that cast a pall over the whole thing, made Impact Wrestling look like shit, but they still put her over. And they still look like they were going to continue to put her over. She didn't show up for matches, but the reasoning was COVID, okay. But you couldn't send in a promo that her deal apparently ends tomorrow. So she was obviously using that to leverage something, which is what it is. I mean, make your money and negotiate however the fuck you want. But to deny that Impact gave her the biggest boost of her career, whatever deal she ends up signing with whomever, that is a direct result of the booking and the care that they took with her at Impact. The slings and arrows that hurt that league by making her world champion and she's not she doesn't even have the decency to do business and she hasn't shown good faith by not sending in a promo would she still fucking under contract and and people say well you don't know the specifics maybe they're, they're supposed to pay her extra for that and then they weren't willing to or dude they made her world fucking champ they made her look like a million bucks. They put her in the ring with people who were willing to put her over, including Brian Cage, who's now getting the fucking mega push in AEW. Job to her. Like, people forget that... They forget about the people that make people. And they forget about the groups that make people. Like with Undertaker's retirement, great example. People are rightfully lauding about Undertaker and how great he is. And grown men saying they, they cried watching the documentary. And his announcement, thank you, Taker. I even saw these ridiculous memes that were like, the WWE made John Cena and made this guy and made that guy, but Undertaker made WWE. Fucking ludicrous. <laughs> ludicrous. The, the number of people that you can argue made WWE, it's either everybody that's wrestled for them or it's like less than three. And Undertaker's not one of them. Then that's not to take away from Undertaker. But Undertaker has engendered a ton of good feeling. Boys love him. You know what I mean? Like, everybody loves Undertaker, which is great. And when that streak was broken, people were really upset, right? People, nobody wanted this. And it's not fair to put Brock Lesnar over, or the, you know, whatever the rationales was. Um, but I remember thinking to myself, you know how many people have put the Undertaker over? That streak exists because that many people fucking lost to him. Right? Like, let's not forget, this isn't an athletically based merit contest. This is a series of people who are put under to hold other people up, right? My thing of you're holding one person, two people are holding one person up, four people are holding those two who are holding the one, and everybody else is holding up the rest. That's how wrestling works, as much as we want to fight it. That's how wrestling's supposed to work, and that's how it works best. And it took a it took a village to get the Undertaker over. Not that he wasn't talented, not that he didn't do his part, not that he never made anybody. He most certainly fucking did, which is why I elevate him to legend status because he made careers as well. Excellent. But and he's going off the right way. Tessa Blanchard's not even dropping the title on the way out. And she couldn't even bother to cut a promo. And this whole thing fucking feels like shit. Um, in a perfect world, what should have happened? Okay, she doesn't want to be fucking in impact anymore. Then sign a 30-day thing where in the agreement, it's like, I'm going to promote this match, and then I'm going to do this match, and I'm going to come drop the title, and then I'm going to go work wherever. She doesn't even have a no-compete clause. She could show up at fucking Fighter Fest on Wednesday, for all we know. She could show up on fucking Raw tonight, for all we know. Right? 
it seems like, and you can say, well, Impact obviously didn't do a great job negotiating that deal. Impact didn't blah, 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 blah. No, all Impact did was make her fucking career. And the least she could do is do them a solid on the way out. And I know I'm right about that. That's why she is Stephen Platinum's Simp of the Week. Stephen Platinum's Simp of the Week. Now, our commentary. Selectivity. Um, oh, by the way, crap. I have an unboxing. Ah, exciting. The commentary's not all that long. And I think I am going to put my speech at the very end, so... Might as well take some time to do an unboxing. Oh, dude. I should have looked at the form. I should have. Opened. Oh, Logan Creed, Brooklyn Creed, that baby Creed. Dude, this shirt is boss as fuck. It looks awesome as shit. And it is the only shirt right now worthy of going over. It's Mimosa. Love it. Love it. Love it. It's badass. My children will try to steal this shirt from me, but they shan't. Because it's for me. And it's awesome. Look how good they look. Look at that baby looking all like, what? And then, of course, the man. And, of course, Brooklyn. God bless her, too. Yay! Thank you. Thank you, heathens. It looks, buy this shit. Look at this shit. This shit looks cool as hell. It looks cool as hell. All right, now I'm all pumped up for the freaking commentary. Um, selectivity. So I've talked before or implied before, you know, as we go after people and in the middle of speaking out, we're going after people and, uh, you know, we're going after supposedly uh racist promoters and calling them out and racist racist promoters and performers and calling them out and you know i've in the past i've said anytime you have a group of piranha going after a bleeding cow i'm always going to look at the bleeding cow and feel bad for it no matter what the situation is right and one thing i've already noted is Promoters who have said really questionable borderline shit don't even get questioned publicly if they have some modicum of power and the boys want to work there. Now, I'm not saying they have to, everybody's got to be lumped in, not even an inquiry. So we bitch up when it comes to the places where we actually want to wrestle. It's easy to get live and tough on the fucking promotions where you don't work anyway that are out of state or their shit shows that's one thing that's that's some selectivity that i noticed but even like tessa blanchard is selectivity selectivity right so impact which once all the shit came out about tessa blanchard her calling a woman the n-word and all this other stuff we kind of forgot about that. And now, because we're excited about the notion of her wrestling Charlotte Flair or working with her father in AEW, let me just say off the rip, Tessa Blanchard is fucking great. I think she's a better worker than Charlotte Flair. Whether you agree with that or not, it's undeniable that they're one and two right now. Or one A and one B. Or tied for first. Fucking great. Does talent mean that she doesn't get put under a microscope? I guess so. And here's the thing about selectivity. Talent and opportunities given have always changed the narrative. Always changed the narrative. If you feel an affection towards something or if you feel that you need something from somebody, you're never going to look at them in the same way. Your lens 
is already altered to the point where you see it differently or ignore it selectively. Everybody does this. Steve, that's not true. Steve, that's not true. Steve, I would never look at ECW. Is Raven a genius? In your eyes? Likely. Does that mean the years-long thing about Raven having sex with a 14-year-old? It's okay because we like Raven or we like the character of Raven. As a friend of mine, Alex loves to say two things can be true. But what can't be true is you can't be the rampaging crusader for Black Lives Matter and for speaking out and all the rest of that. And even with the, the barest amount of easy research, one, if you didn't know the Raven Becky Bayless story that's been around forever and is a virtual certainty and has been told many times over, if you don't know the story, then you don't know much about wrestling in the last 20 years. But more than that, maybe you just choose to ignore it selectivity maybe you just get to ignore sandman because you like sandman and i see sandman get booked here in florida and they were he's an icon and legend until he fucks them over on their show and all of a sudden he's a piece of shit wasn't he a piece of shit when he talked about how he would drug fucking drinks to get women selectivity Is that my, am I saying all of ECW was shit? No. By all accounts, Tommy Dreamer's that dude. Awesome. But other ones. Sabu doesn't engage in abusive behavior. Maybe not criminally so, but who hasn't witnessed Sabu treating fucking genie like dog shit? Of course you witnessed it. Do I have to go through a list of ECW people who you could easily point to like, yeah, definitely abusive. Yeah, definitely like borderline up and down the line. Now, if you want to engage in a discussion about, well, yes, that happened at that point in wrestling and blah, 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 blah. But certainly some of the things are so egregious they should carry over regardless. But more than that, so we are saying that being selective is okay. And I'm only saying that because it's in behavior that I see everybody engaging in who's quick to piranha motherfuckers. All of them are picking and choosing. And that's not necessarily bad. That doesn't necessarily make them hypocrites. But it certainly points in that direction. Nor, did not, and I'm not saying the fact that these things are out there. This is not a what about thing. Well, what about this? What about that? That doesn't excuse the stuff going on that people are trying to call out and people are dealing with. But what untoward stuff has happened in WWE slash WWF history that doesn't pass the smell test? And too often, I see wrestling people in particular with this incredible ability to be selective in their outrage. Two things can be true. Chris Benoit was a great professional wrestler. But to blithely disconnect the horror of him killing his wife and child now, you may further argue, yeah, brain damage, all these mitigating factors led to that. Okay. But let me ask this simple question. Do you think abuse never happened until they were killed? You know the answer. 
How many people ignored it? How many people turned a blind eye? How many people continue to turn a blind eye? There are people that twist themselves into knots who will go, I don't think Chris Benoit killed them. They will twist themselves into that level of a knot. These flat earth wrestling motherfuckers. And they're all over the place. But they just epitomize what I see everybody doing, which is being highly selective in their outrage. They're just taking it to an insane extent. What needs to happen? What needs to happen is if we are demanding that structural t changes take place in society and in wrestling and how wrestling companies are run and the kind of behavior that we expect, especially from the people who have power, especially from the people who are in charge, I'm all for it. But that means you have to apply that as much as you can everywhere. That's when it becomes difficult. That's when you realize concessions really do have to be made. That's when you realize you've already made concessions. And that you yourself have to evaluate your structure, your standards, and how you apply things. And that is a difficult thing to do for everybody, including and especially me. But it's necessary because if through this tumultuous time where wrestling is dead <clears throat> and has a chance to reinvent itself, where all these people who have claimed to love wrestling are now whining about, oh, I don't think I can go back and blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. Uh, I get it. I have been there to an extent. Uh, but one thing that I hope doesn't get repeated is we just have a whole new set of equal but different hypocritical standards because that's what got us fucking here in the first place. This has been Full Disclosure. Wrestling is being humbled. The mighty WWE is making reckless decisions and at a time where they could lead, they could show massive creativity, they could provide true entertainment and comfort, they are behind every other sport and entertainment venture and how to deal with COVID and how to utilize the biggest talent monopoly and largest creative staff in our industry. And they are paying for it in low ratings, bad press, and shows that have brief shining moments of greatness in otherwise a sea of malaise. They are humbled. AEW was exciting, breaking out, gaining crowds, whipping NXT, gonna have a second TV show. Now they're dealing with a series of unforced errors, stupid, avoidable injuries a dwindling audience, the feeling that they need adults in the room, and the general feeling that they are in a holding pattern when they should be skyrocketing and that their whole venture feels far more fragile than it did at the beginning of the year. They too are humbled. The NWA was riding high. The people that loved them loved them. But early signs of arrogance have now given way to the truth that I've been saying all along that having Dave Lagana in charge of most everything was a horrible way to go. And the initial good feelings and well wishes have now given way to will they be back? And does it matter if they do? And it's their own fault because we haven't heard nary a peep from those three letters that used to be the North Star for our business, but now either elicit a gallows chuckle or an unknowing shrug. They are humbled. Ring of Honor used to be that group. I want to wrestle for them, the boys would say. This is where wrestling is going, we would think. Now, it truly appears to be the case, but that ain't a good thing anymore. This is where wrestling is going. No star power. Connected to business partners, I say that in quotes, that don't inspire hope or the feeling of caring or competence. Resigning themselves to be lesser than. 
in the name of being realistic instead of being idealistic, trudging along instead of dreaming. They are humbled. MLW is doing what they can. They're making the smart, practical, and responsible choices. Are they really going to be a thing, though? Do people really want them? Are we going to care about them a year from now? What's the vision? Who's their champion? How can you see them? Do you want to? Until most wrestling fans can positively answer those questions about MLW, they are humbled. Impact. But they're really good. You should watch. You say it, right? The speaking out movement took a bigger chunk out of impact than anyone. But when you think about it, they were born TNA. So lame. They've done great things. They've had great wrestlers. They've had great matches. And they've also done some of the most embarrassing stuff going in wrestling. Sometimes it's, oh, they're still there. Sometimes it's, oh, they're still here. They are most certainly humbled. The UK in general, what a mess. There's a dozen reasons why, and we're finding out about all of them. They are most certainly humbled. Japan. Even before all of this, let's be honest, did, quote, wrestling in Japan, unquote, mean what it once did? It did not. And after all this, what will it mean then? It's a scary thing to think about. But yes, they are humbled. Oh, my indie wrestling. The sins that I've just outlined in all of the big leagues, we have them all. What have we found out about many of the promoters who run promotions, the supposed bookers who implement the vision, our fellow performers, and everyone else who helps to make the world we work in and create the experience for the frenemies known as the modern wrestling fan? In many cases, we found out that people in wrestling are dumber than we thought, more ignorant than we thought, more obstinate than we thought, more sexist than we thought, more racist than we thought, more fearful than we thought, less caring than we thought, less qualified than we thought, more twisted than we thought. We found out, in short, that wrestling really is a microcosm of the states, the society, the country, and the world at large. But wrestling is a little different too. And therein lies the hope. Wrestling is different. It's always been edgier. It's always been fringe. It's always been outlaw from its birth in the carnivals to it helping to launch television to having almost 2,000 people make a living from professional wrestling in the territories to dominating cable television to creating the pay-per-view industry to making the jump to streaming services that are have entirely wrestling content wrestling has always reinvented wrestling has always found a way and wrestling has always been outside of the provinces of political correctness and i will admit for myself that was one of the big appeals right that i could come up with gimmicks or i could say things that you couldn't say in other entertainment forms but now wrestling has had to catch up and what we found out was there are so many good things about wrestling being on the outside but there are also a lot of things that weren't good and as things have gotten uncovered this wall of silence that wrestling has always built around itself which we used to call kayfabe and now we just call not mattering as much if we're being honest it came with a price any time there's an exclusivity any time there's this idea of don't let other people know what's going on it's going to 
not only protect certain aspects of the business, it's going to also protect those who want to do their dirt in the darkness. And now all of that's coming to light. Hopefully. But that can be a good thing. Because as I see different people pronounce that pro wrestling is doomed now, that maybe crowds won't come back now that shows are opening. Maybe people have gotten such a distaste for the things that have happened and been revealed about pro wrestling that they won't want to become back. And on the national level, I will be honest, that might be true. But on the indie level, which is the level that I care about the most, it's not true at all. I say all the time, it's not amazing that pro wrestling isn't bigger. It's amazing that it exists at all. So since we are still alive, we're playing with house money. And if we're playing with house money, then it's time to go big. It's time to really make pro wrestling what we think it should be, what our collective vision says it should be. And you might be saying, there is no collective vision. Then we need to develop one. How can we do this? You hear about the three R's when it comes to education. I hate the three R's, right? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Dumb. But the idea is sound, that there are fundamental things that you need to have to be considered educated and to be able to function effectively. Well, I believe there are four R's in wrestling. Let me just leave them with you. In pro wrestling, especially at the indie level, to overcome everything that's happening right now, we need to reinvent. We need to change how wrestling is presented. We need to figure out how to do that. Not just promoters and bookers, but the boys and the girls as well. Need to be included in the conversation. We need to rebel. We need to say, the things that are not okay, we can determine for ourselves what those are. We can determine for ourselves what the good business practices are. We don't need state commissions coming in and taking people's money. But we no longer need to tolerate the insidious behavior of trainers, bookers, promoters, our fellow wrestlers. We don't need to have this victim and victimizer mentality that's taken over wrestling where we look at our audience as suckers and we look at female performers as potential sexual conquests and we look at the boys if you're a promoter or a booker as those pains in the asses that you have to deal with and manipulate to get what you want yes there are aspects of pro wrestling that are always going to be manipulative, right? We're trying to create an experience where people are suspending disbelief and we're attempting to pull things out of them emotionally. Sure. But everything doesn't need to be a zero-sum game where, where somebody is losing and somebody is winning on our own shows. We can rebel against old notions that no longer work, and we should. That's not to say you get rid of everything, but I'll get to that in a moment. The third R is risk. We need to take chances with our shows. We don't need to take chances, unnecessary chances with safety, but we need to take risks as far as performing. We need to let wrestlers try things as long as they're running it past people we need to let them try and things will fail but i'll take that over one independent card that i can't tell apart from the other one i want to see risk i want to see chips pushed on the table and yes sometimes you'll lose all of those chips but it's wrestling you can reinvent and come back again Reinvent, rebel, risk, but the fourth R that is perhaps the most important is to remember. Remember why you love this shit. 
remember how you can make it better. Remember that you can collectively decide to make it right. And remember that it's up to the independent promotions to drive the business forward. We've always said we take our lead and we take our cues from the WWE and the other big groups. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to work for those groups. It's a wonderful goal. But what we're finding out as of this idea of where the goldfish swim, the feces follow, and thinking of independent wrestling as the feces has led us here. The major groups have let us down and independent promotions have taken on all of that toxicity. Well, now we, the independent promotions, need to expunge the toxicity first, and we need to lead. We need to be the creative driving force, and we need to get credit for it. Reinvent, rebel, risk, and remember. That's the way that we'll come back together. This has been Stephen Platinum.